All right, welcome everybody. I think that uh, everything's working as it should now. We've got our audio and our video feed running. You can see John is live in the gallery, running around the exhibition. And uh, we're gonna connect his audio in a few minutes. We're really excited with this opportunity to hear from the artist himself, um, straight, straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. But then also the, the brilliant commentary of, of Gordon McConnell, who's been a, a longtime collaborator with John Lodge and is an essayist in the forthcoming catalog. And um, Gordon, as many of you know, is a visual artist in his own right and makes um, some of the brilliant paintings that you can see in the background on his Zoom feed there. Um, he not only studied fine arts, but uh, ended up being a curator at the, the Yellowstone Art Museum for nearly two decades before he focused solely on his uh, artistic practice and in writing career. So we're really delighted to have uh, Gordon here. Thanks for, for being here. The other person you'll see below um, is John Kalsbeek, associate curator. And he um, has known both Gordon and John Lodge for, for many, many years. Uh, he's He's, one of the, the longest standing employees at the Missoula Art Museum, which I always feel like is, uh, is saying something that everybody, um, he's, he's got the institutional knowledge and just a wonderful relationship with artists and, and, and great insights into their, their practices and their work. And John, as many of you know, um, just has a, an incredible biography and, and career. He grew up in, in Red Lodge, Montana, and uh, the story that, that he recounted to us is, is that he was, he was more, less interested in the forests that were surrounding him and, and more, more interested in the, the infrastructure and the apparatus of the, of the, uh, the machinery that was in, in the town. And we thought that was such a wonderful and strange comment. Um, he ran track in, in school and in that idea of being a long distance runner has always stayed with him. Um, in the 60s, then he went to the Berkeley School of Music, Berkeley College of Music uh, in Boston, and then um, stayed on there as the, the school's photographer and art director for many years. And that was what led him into visual art and, and that idea of working with black and white imagery and, and printing um, led to his career as a commercial, not only as a visual artist, but as a, a commercial photographer, a commercial printer, excuse me, at Artcraft Printers, where he had a long, um, wonderful career in the, in the commercial printing business. He's, he produced many of the fine artist catalogs that, that MAM uh, has represented projects with. And we were so excited about our long-term collaboration together. Um, something interesting about this show is since his retirement from Artcraft Printers, he's, uh, he's really focused on his artistic career and has had wonderful solo exhibitions, not only at uh, the University of Wyoming Art Museum, but also at Northcutt Steel Gallery in Billings, as well as some other places. And, and those, those shows inadvertently led to the MAM show and many of the ideas that he was engaging with um, are really represented really well here. The difference is the shift in scale uh, for the Carnegie Gallery, John really scaled, scaled up his production and you can see that when you come and visit the Missoula Art Museum. Um, I did wanna say that we, we have a catalog in production and uh, this is just a, a prototype of the, the brilliant catalog that that John Lodge is um, self-designing for the exhibition. And it has many of the wonderful installation photographs and individual pieces, but uh, a great essay, as I mentioned, by, by Gordon. And then um, John's characteristic inventiveness and, and playfulness. Uh, I did wanna mention that we're really grateful to project sponsors, Aunt Dove's Gallery in Willow Creek, Montana. Uh, Hilary M. Graff Charitable Giving Foundation and, the, and Robin Graff Evans, and then also to Nancy and Brad Picard because the, their support of both the catalog and the exhibition um, really make this possible. So thank you very much for your generosity and your support 
of these projects and, and especially supporting an artist like John Lodge, who's um, come to this moment in his career. It's been a long time coming and, and we're just so excited to be here with him. Thank you. John wants you to experience uh, Swarm in all of its glory, uh, him interfacing with the projection on the piece as a way to begin tonight. Could I uh, supplement your introduction, Brandon? Please do, Gordon. Um, I'd like, I've, I've, I've been uh, fortunate to know John for nearly four decades and uh, he's enlivened my life and lighted my path in Billings all that time with his involvement in, in jazz, his uh, guidance of me as a, uh, a writer learning to write for publications, uh, learning to do graphic design myself. And um, it was really a joy to uh, spend quality time with him since uh, February, visiting his studio and then having several interviews and interactions with uh, Pat Zentz, an, another great avant-garde artist of Montana, and a, a longtime uh, colleague of, of ours. And uh, I'd like to just read uh, the conclusion I came to in my essay about John making some claims about his significance. And this is brief. So uh, <laughs> John is better at improvising than I am. So I'm gonna just rely on the page. John Lodge as an artist and musician is a product of the great period of modernist innovation that followed World War II and peaked in the 1960s and 70s. He studied and was deeply absorbed in avant-garde music during that period. Later, when he began to explore painting and sculpture in the 1990s, he gravitated towards some of the greatest innovators of that period, including Jackson Pollock, Joseph Boys, Gerhard Richter, Saul LeWitt, Richard Serra, and Donald Judd. John found the possibilities these artists uncovered to be liberating. With his experience and knowledge of music and the printing industry, he brings a unique perspective and considerable depth and insight to the contributions he is making now to the modernist tradition. The works in this exhibition introduce new materials and processes, interrogate the categories of painting, sculpture, printmaking, and time-based media, and employ in an unprecedented way commercial printing processes to make sculpture and one-of-a-kind prints and books. The work is groundbreaking, serious, and deeply engaging. It challenges and inspires. There is a modernist avant-garde in Montana, and John Lodge is its leading light. Thanks, Gordon. That, that was really a great, uh, great introduction. I did want to mention to everybody who's joined um, that you're welcome to ask questions throughout, either using the Q&A function or the chat function, and we'll field those. We'll see them coming in, and we'll repeat them to John. So even though he's connected to our audio, uh, he's not able to read read the individual chats, so we're happy to to telegraph to telegraph those out to him. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention before we get started is that we're situated on the traditional grounds of the Salish and the Upper Kalispell people, and you see this piece by Neil Parsons behind me. It it's really represented our connection to American Indian contemporary artwork in the galleries and in our collection. And we're, we're really grateful for the, the work they do and, and representing that, that cultural work here at MAM. Um, so thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I, I think you're in for a wild ride. Thank you. Go for it, John. We've got you muted right now. So we, we need you to unmute, but we'd love to hear your interaction with Swarm. There you go. There, my there. There's a perfect example right at the start of fracturing 
the flow right there. So this is fracture. I'm here in the midst of swarm, as you can see the connotation or connection to the frequency modulated uh, vacillating spasming uh, uh, radiating imagery based on surface tension and variables created by time-lapse photography. And this, what you see here is me immersed in this swarm, which is endlessly variable and random. And yet it is still connected to the form of its original image. And what creates that is a fracture of time. I took a, a time-lapse video of the still swarm picture in its frequency modulated surface tension environment of particles and waves and reflections. I shot this. That is still, and I did time lapse photography of a still object. This is a fracture. Yes, how can you do time lapse of something that is still? Where does the spasming, where does the vacillation, where does the modulation, something that wouldn't be generated by uh, camera motion or by creating it maybe even in editing. It is the flow of accidental timing of the time-lapse system. And the motion is not the still stasis piece. It's the handheld iPhone time-lapse camera that I'm using to photograph. So what you see is, is John Lodge motion, iPhone motion. It creates these random jerks and spasms in the system. The, the, the radiating system is then looped and forms variables throughout the system. The other part, the component of it is the existence of what is real and what is, is real with this piece. We're projecting, we're projecting a, an image of this piece itself onto itself. So what we see here with that process I just mentioned, time lapse. So now I'm going to add another layer, another layer, layer of variable that I can interrupt this projection of itself. It's like hologram, for instance, maybe of itself. And I can create another composition or layer or pulsation throughout the system with my shadow, which I like to think of as an umbra. It's my umbra and it creates a penumbra. So that if you were to, to uh, see this, we see the projected, the projected image of itself that has all of the variables and all the randomness of not quite projecting at the same perspective or the linear distortion values. And it has all kinds of variables of reflectiveness depending on the focal length of the lens and the lens abrasion factors within the lens. And now we can also eliminate all of that just by creating and interrupting the flow. So there I'm interrupting the flow. I'm creating a different composition I'm seeing the piece with its radiance projection of its self image. I'm also seeing the original piece, the form of the piece with all of its elements, the frequencies and amplitude modulation hybrid, the reflection of the ambient light instead of the pro pro projected light. All of those dynamics are, are, are operating in this system. The system is constantly changing and evolving. It's based on radiance and based on the concept, is, it's conceptual. What is real? Is the projection real? Is the piece real? Is the both of them together, merged together? And this is looped, so it's an endless stream of these capturing the time fragments. So this is based on luminosity. We're going to move over here to this piece. This piece has evolved from a piece from about two years ago that was in the uh, uh, University of Wyoming Art Museum that was uh, the same materials and uh, based on the concept of null. 
the title of the piece with 100% black, no, uh, void, nothing, black, dull. This piece is much larger, the same materials. The materials are shredded, fractured, shredded, fractured, uh, of rubber and gesso. Very simple materials based on layer of layering the, the material onto the surface. This piece is not about luminance, it's about absorption. It's what the piece does because of the deep thickness of the texture of this. The title of this piece, by the way, is monochromatic monolith. So the texture are layers and layers and applied of mixed by by shaping and uh, Reapplying and creating a uh, reductive and deconstruction of the application, and then, re and then tapping into the, the deconstruction element, which is the tape laced with the density of the, of the, of the, of the granulated rubber, the, the, the shredded rubber, and then reapply it. So it has a, an image derived from its reduction, is also an addition, an accumulation. So this piece has. The density of real black, the, the shredded rubber is very matte and very damp. And just to show the illustration of the aspects that's happening, happening with this piece is that it, is, it absorbs light. It absorbs light to a certain degree depending on how it's lit. And it also, because of the surface is so uneven and so soft because of the, grand, the uh, fractured rubber and all of the, the uh, uh, uneven surfaces, it not only, not only absorbs light, but it absorbs sound. So we're gonna have an experiment of the concept, uh, uh, Tim, of, of, the, of, of how we can cont control through, not just zooming, we, we can zoom on the piece and get a perspective of the form of the piece, but we can, which is typically done, but we can also, so to speak, zoom with the aperture of the camera. So we can zoom, we can start here, right? And here I am, and we can zoom the aperture of the piece and my, just like the uh, luminous, I was merged with the swarm, I am now merging with this piece. Not by luminous like the other, but by zooming or modulating or fracturing the exposure. This is kind of like, I, I like this because it, it has a connection to the original title of 100% black and null and void and whole. But it also has a connection to Anish Kapoor's work where he gets, he developed a paint that absorbs light at 99.9% .9 of light. It actually absorbs. So what, what it does, it, it diminishes three-dimensional objects that are put on a two-dimensional plane. It is so absorbing of, of, of light that you don't recognize the three dimensions. And I, we've accomplished that here with close to black and the combination of these surfaces and the exposure. Could you bring that, Tim, can you bring that back now to the exposure yep. of, of uh, yeah. Just for the just for you audience members who are wondering what in the hell is going on, um, Tim Tim Daniel is the cameraman, and John is going to be in, incorporating Tim into the artist talk uh, at intervals. Yeah, so Tim is going to be. We, we need to art direct instantaneously. This is an improvisation <laughs> fracturing of the linearity of, of the piece, which is the nature of the show. So we could do that because this is the format. This is actually his plan to be random. It's planned fractures, disruption. We had a big fraction right at the start, I think fractures up just about broke down. But that's great, because that's part of it, and that gave us an experience of reality as it relates to the, the exhibition. Do we have that control of the aperture, Tim? It is do, do you want me to go yeah. dark or, or yeah, light? Yeah, we need to get it dark, down or dark. We need to merge, merge into... Uh, You're merged. Yeah, you can see how it merges, how I merge into the, into the lighting is affecting it. But anyway, you get, uh, it's getting close to zero, to 100% black density. John, I think that that's such a great, um, great introduction to the way that you, you think about structuring your work and about synthesizing ideas and, and bringing things together. 
and I know that as you've worked in your studio for this show, uh, all these ideas about uh, about making have, have been floating around. And one of the things that I'm wondering if you can talk about is um, you really don't think of these as, as paintings. Can you talk a little bit about, about interfacing? Yeah. Yeah, these are really not pen. The, the surface you see of all these black surfaces, the actual surface, the, 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 the primary imagery is, is not created by paint. It's created by carbon particles. So uh, the, the, the infrastructure of the piece is, is gesso, which is the simplest form of paint, acrylic paint. But what the, the formation of the visual element is, is created by layers of black carbon, carbon particles, which I don't think think could be considered paint. So they are a hybrid, you know, some sort of a hybrid. But back to the, back to our, can we get back to our null piece? <laughs> because uh, in our interview with Corey Walsh, Brandon, I was explaining this same piece and I mentioned the uh, not only the light absorption that we have now, and then Gordon alludes to that also, that is also, it's acoustic, it absorbs sound. It absorbs sound also. So we just gave an illustration of of the absorption of light. So I wanted to give a demonstration of a theoretical or maybe a conceptual, or maybe it could be visual uh, perception of sound being involved. And this is now a merging and a connectivity and a connection to my experience as a jazz musician in the 60s. I'm right here live going to do a sound check Merge this, uh, creating sound from a from a, uh, a machine. I, I like to think of this as a machine, also not a machine. It's a, definitely a machine. It's got cylinders. It's made out of metal. It's got you know it's a, it's a machine. When you uh, connect, have the connectivity to to my experience working with the machine. I am here in the museum, a major show. I am here having not practiced or played this horn for about twenty two years, except for some other performances of this nature which has me with no warm up and without playing, actually uh, demonstrating a, uh, I'm gonna start with, a, I'm gonna play a Thelonious Monk tune. So we'll hear the sound, we'll hear it fractured, which is good, we can fracture so we can, we can have that. And also it's, uh, the, the tune is uh, based on uh, fracturing uh, the melodic phrase and then rearranging the fractures in displacement of it's called rhythmic displacement, pulse displacement. So it's a we got multi levels here. We got my background with the horn. We got my visual art. It's going to connect here with a demonstration of sound into this absorption surface, like like um, uh, uh, Gordon and uh, Brandon have both mentioned, and they they thought that was a really interesting concept that the art is not just visual. It could have a connection to being audio in its nothingness but it's still nothing, it's black. It's about as, it's as close to nothing as you can get. It's fun, you know, people come and they look at, you know, let's see the film and then transcend, which is fine. But here is straight note chaser, black, trying to be absorbed. It doesn't get as good as the light being absorbed because it's like more reflection. We're gonna test, we're gonna make a test with this, we're gonna make an attack, we're gonna make a test against the hard surface of the wall, and then we're going to do a test. The floor. Mm. Up the head, straight no chase, Thelonious Monk. Isn't that beautiful? Thelonious Monk, you have to be a genius with an egg. Here's the same tune against the wall, up against the wall. Conceptual. We can hear it here live. I doubt if all of the mechanisms in the uh, uh, system of microphones and transmission and head headband and compression are going to pick on that. But you can you can still just visually see the concept. 
Now, for the floor, though, we're going to get really down the floor. I'm going to play or, an Ornette Coleman tune, which again represents a uh, considerable amount of fracturing and rearranging and displacement of rhythms and melodic phrases. We'll see how that, if we can get some sort of a uh, feeling or even just how it looks or how it echoes. It's going to appear in the show, but the soundscape is going to be, it's going to change. We're going to change up the tune. And this is really going to get fractured. This is the tune uh, Blues Connotation, or Nat Coleman. of a lot of things, connectivity to my experience that we grabbed and loaded to. Any, uh, any uh, comments? Any, uh, uh, I think uh, a lot of this is being inspired by, by uh, my conversations with John uh, Calvi and Brandon and, and Gordon and uh, my life partner, Jane Wagner Dester, and just about everyone else, and uh, especially. Uh, Another young gentleman I just met, met here, the tech, tech, um, uh, uh, technician, Michael. You're, yeah. uh, that. you're getting that, scattered, scattered applause from the audience, John. You can't, you can't see the chat, but you're getting little thumbs up, <laughs> scattered applause. Thank you. That was incredible. Okay. Kim, we're going to go from here. Okay. But speaking of John Calfee, let's go over here. This is Cumulus Undulatus Fractus. If you, don't, if you want to get the scale, the scale of it is uh, it's a, a, about it's close to 35 inches uh, wide by the, the each sheet of paper is uh, 23 inches. It's uh, 9,111 sheets of paper. Some, sometimes it's 8,915, but I recalculated and there were some other sheets. So anyway, you know, we got to get this. There's actually, I think. 9,111 sounds a lot better, and I think that might be pretty close. And we'll go with it because I have something in a count of 9,111 sheets of paper, and those weigh, uh, you can calculate the weight, it weighs, uh, you know, 915 uh, pounds. We're pretty close to that. 915 pounds. This was the experience. We worked on it. Uh, I worked on it over a period of two or three months. I let uh, Brandon know what we were doing, we did some tests. I didn't know if this was going to fly, if it was going to float, you know, if it was going to, it was going to make it. But uh, I just kept sticking with it. And it's what, so we went and uh, <coughs> went to project blank uh, skid. This comes in a skid, blank paper. And we printed the paper based on random planned fractured systems. We had the whole concept of fracture in mind. So what we did, we took the printing press, we deprogrammed the pressman to forget everything he knew about ink and water balance, running the press, keeping everything in register, let everything go. And he allowed me to manipulate the press also. So essentially, we, I developed, instead of, we were turning levers, we turned the ink way up to three times the, you know, three times what it should be. We put it, pull it down, we put the water balance at the, at the metal, you know, persistent is the ink and water. And we were manipulating, plus I would, I would spray you know, cleaning uh, solvent, you know, that destroyed the totally breaks up all of the, uh, the ink. And anyway, we pulverized these sheets. But we did have a system. I said, we're going to basically, when we turn these levers off and on, let's do two on and three off and then five on and then eight off. And so we, again, like I always like to do, to just to have some implication of a grid in all of this randomness, is there's a Fibonacci system running through there conceptually, just to give it a touch of, you can't probably see it. But it's there somewhere. John, the the thing you might let the audience know is the when Tim pans up those those uh, plates on the wall are the actual <laughs> printing plates yeah. that produce the. So that was this is the piece you see the form. Actually, it's it's the equivalent of a of a uh, eighteen thousand page book. 
is what it is. An 18,000 page book would be the equivalent of this, and it's a wonderful, uh, the, way it, the way it went down. Now let's get, how did it get to this form? Because it was printed in one continuous stack. This is where John Kelvick comes in. I'm sorry if I'm just, but we rolled the skin, it was shipped very efficient, just one solid, beautiful, efficient block of paper. It's so efficient and dense, it takes up no space. You can ship it on a truck, on a pallet for 80 bucks from Billings to Missoula. I mean, and it gets there the next day. That's, that's, it. that's part of this system. Well, we have to do it just because of that, just the logistics of the piece. So it comes, so we have it sitting here about two weeks. It showed up plenty of time, no, no deadline problem. So we, we uh, when you're installing the, the, the whole show, we, uh, we, this became, this came up the next day. Okay, so we roll, roll the skid out. We're not, and Brandon is running the show. We're not gonna, you know, I, I remember I asked, they roll the skid out, drop it down. And Brandon said, starts, okay, let's get going. I said, what are we gonna do here? And I said, wait a minute. I remember saying, can, can, can I meditate on this a little bit? <laughs> just let me think, just get to absorb maybe what, oh, that's, that's okay. So that was great because this is plan random. This is about fracturing time also. So we're gonna have a lot of time. Smooth, you know, smooth flow of time. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we take it and there it is sitting right here. And it's heavy, you know, it's big. We all three get lined up together. And, and I'm hoping that this is gonna slay out, you know, and just from this fractured, endless fascinating event. So we give it all of the, we have velocity and energy, push, and it goes plunk, plunk. <laughs> this, this drops here and this drops here. And it was like two seconds of silence. And I, yeah, that's, that's it. it. Wow, it made its own form, it's its own happening based on its, all of the elements of gravity and friction and density and force and velocity, all physics. And that's what it is, and that's what we're going with. We're not gonna to try to intervene with it. Okay, except, wait a minute, one thing, one rule I said that I suspect there might be some out of parameter, squirrely, random things that happen. They're too random, too squirrely, that we can't intervene if we need to, to some degree. Just some little touching and tweaking this thing is allowed. And that's part of the rule, that's part of the plan. We do have a backup plan to intervene with this. So here's where this piece actually becomes manifest by John Calvi. Because, because after the two seconds of me going, oh, John Calvi very quickly reached down and flipped one of these over. And that was the touch. But that operation that he did, I think he would, I think he started to do it. He wanted like, why well, I actually think I helped him, John. Did I help him flip that over? I think it was a collaboration, I think. But it was wonderful. Again, the randomness of another human being in the fact of that in too, that's one, you know. So John actually attributed a huge uh, uh, element as far as the, the, the creation of this piece. So here you see the piece, there it is. John Kelpie, John Lodge. Unfortunately, John, you're not, your name's not on the work on that. Now, what we see here is the byproduct. This is probably the three dimensional sculpture. This is the connection of the grid that made all of this out of control press. This represents the out of control press and the interface of the grid that's up here. These are the plates that are also made in a random nature, in an environment of planned random. You can see there are test patterns, there are seismic wave vibration readings from seismic data, there's, there's screens, there's television screen static, there's inside, uh, you start working with patterns and grids, right? Patterns and grids. You're going to the interface with this random printing. But here are the plates. Well, they can, you see they're not really perfect because they've been pulverized to the point where they've been influenced by the ink also. Like here's so much ink, so much solvents on the piece that that's captured in the piece. But if you strip all of that away, you'll see these perfect patterns. Here's an inside envelope gift. They're sending a check somewhere from the bank. There's some squares, there's a lot of half-tone dots. Here's another piece of one, it actually scans the pieces. Here's a perforated, 
uh, uh, the perforated piece that's over there, the rod and cone piece. Anyway, you get the idea. And then some are actually holograms. I have the, the these aren't imaged straight to a, to a plate. There's the intermediary process where the, where the image is exposed to the plate. So instead of using a negative of a graphic style that's generated from the digital file, I did the technique of laying a physical object on the plate surface and using that to make the image. So there's yarn. These are, these are variables of yarn. This is actually sandwiching bubble wrap onto the front of the feet. Uh, there's another one here that is uh, somewhere in here is a pile of magnetic tape that really created a wonderful variation. When it mushes down in the vacuum frame, it creates an endless random swirl of, 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 of plus and minus. Here's a grayscale. Here's a grayscale reference chart here. Here's, here's what I like is, is target, focus perfect target charts. Get everything in perfect register. And we can see those being pulverized and shredded and fractured. Yeah, very much uh, structure that created this piece. One of the comments that uh, MJ Williams is with us, and she she said it reminds her of Anselm Kiefer, and I think that's a pretty prescient comment for two reasons. One is the the sense of scale, and one is how process driven you are. And I'm I'm wondering if you can talk about a little bit how that process drives the creation of the the form of the work. Yeah, yeah, the process is what it is and combined with the materials. I mean, it, it breaks down, this, the, it, it all breaks down into process. And, that, and that's the techniques, that, that's the, the hardware, say, the, the process or the machines that are, that are used. By the way, I, I failed to mention all of these pieces with all their variables are made by machines. That's what I really like with this, it's a machine that even, it's not a machine that I've run, I've lost even control of the machine, someone else has printed these and used a machine. So all of the variables are made in a very machine that defined environment. That's a process, right? The process of, of shoving this, with pushing, forcing this, that's a, that's a process. We're gonna use force and velocity to push something over, right? In, in combination with the materials. All of these other pieces, all of these pieces that I say aren't paintings, they're, 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 it's every piece, are process. And the process is drip, drip process. That's a profound, simple process. All of these are derived from drips. Dripping, the, free, the, the swarm piece, I mentioned that I think it's a frequency modulation, frequency modulation of those round uh, uh, dots which by the way, Gordon McConnell has coined the phrase, they look like when you see them, when you saw them in the umbra, in the umbra of the re real uh, ambient light, they look like googly eyes so because they're black and they have the white lines. So that's great. I love that they're googly eyes. We're gonna put some googly eyes in there, emerge again and see at some point. But that, that is the process. It's very profound. I like, to, I like to think of that drip process that I have. It's what I use is a squeeze bottle with a nozzle. And you see all of these structures, you'll see our drips. And the drips from that piece and some of the other piece, the drips are made with the squeeze bottle and what, what creates the variable. Again, the process, process, simple, drips, the distance. You change the distance to the surface that you squeeze. Why don't you, you walk us? Three, the process, the amounts, but you can't, you can't, you can't. Placement becomes, becomes an issue so that you, you that, that is the process that's defined, and then you tap into that, and then you manufacture the piece based on that system and process. There was a materials merged with the process. Walk so us over to a piece so we can see that close up, John, because I think that that, uh, that, that physicality of the, of the piece and the layering of, of the gesso. Oh, yeah, we definitely are, have to see that, because all of these are very three-dimensional. You know, yeah. Are three dimensional. Let's go over here to circular, circular circulation. These are like fractals because these are the drip process that are then re, re uh, are generated into other drips, which are larger. So they're like fractals. That the, the total is a composite of all of the elements that combine to make the composite. And this is if you if you get into this, you'll see all of the dripping going on and the process of interfering interfacing the drips. 
which are controlled but decontrolled with the carbon paper. The carbon paper in its interface is what loosens this up and deconstructs whatever control to some degree there may be. Although the nozzle is e even with all the variables of distance and force and pressure, by the way, you can get an articulation with the squeeze, which is very similar to the articulation of playing a horn. You get an air, the air flow, you get an articulation. So these are articulations of grips also. And I like to think of the grips as goes back to the wonderful, miraculous in, uh, process that, that changed the world in, in I think 1949. Jackson Pollock deconnected from the brush and decontrolled to some degree and they are called his grip paintings. He gripped the paint on the surface by spreading it and that changed, that simple process, that simple changed how abstraction looked. It removed a lot of gesture out of this. By the way, these are, if you really think about these, there's nothing about gesture going on in here. These are made by straight off accidents created by dripping and then re-dripping. The circles are made from the mold, but let's get back to your, I'm, I'm not, there's a lot of things going on here, but let's look at three dimensionality here. Um, you know, we, we can see up here, if you look at this tip, we can zoom in, you can see the, the layers. And a lot of those vertical and horizontal lines are the, the edges of the carbon paper that you use as you're applying the carbon, is that right? Right, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's the grid. That's what makes these, for me, that's what makes these happen. It's the straight line emits all of this. How would you ever do that? How would you ever control that? You couldn't even do it with tape. But because of the interface of the carbon and the edge is perfectly cut, you can, I can actually control to some degree these perfect slices that slice through and, and create a grid that, that creates a piece. The other grid that's in here is the, you see these circles are generated by a, by a, a, a template, a template, which is, you see the circle? These are like embroidery groups. So it's what I do, I use those for hoops, but then I try to pulverize them. I try to grip through them and expand and, and, uh, and, and fracture, fracture the perfection of that perfect circle. And, and it's what happens, it splatters randomly out. So it's like, again, controlling, we have the, the implication, but then we want to fracture that and, and just have a, have a, have a, like a shadow or residual reference to the circular perfection of a circular a uh, mold, say a mold or template. So that's, you know, uh, can you bring us over to stratifracture and show us how this, the same the same ideas are happening in, in that piece? And I, I think this is, uh, this is one of the pieces that I saw early on in the studio that really, really was coming out of the, the process of multiple canvases and... Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's just one, one thing I always like to have random sound occur at some point, or the, the uh, concept of a sound, uh, this would signal something to happen. Maybe it's the 10 minute warning, okay? Uh, just so we should, from where we start, uh, stratus fracture. Uh, start of strata, strata fracture. Strata fracture, when, uh, it, it, this piece is the perfect combination of planned and random. I mean, it's just miraculous how all of the, 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 uh, uh, the turbulence and it, it, what it looks like, turbulence and waveforms and especially vibration of these black module squares, uh, uh, rectangles, rectangles that are infused with what implies to random particles of waveforms or vibration that are generated by the interaction of the carbon colloid substrate that we've been talking about, the carbon paper, and its relationship to the layer, the, the layer that supplies simple layer of gesso, those two simple elements. It meant self manufactures all of these variables of surface. So it's like pure, it's like nature. This is generated by how I have, what, I, what is influence, like what conditions I have established. Uh, to, to generate some of these. And the conditions are 
vibration that looks like vibration. Heat, uh, th these have been applied and manufactured in, in variable conditions of heat outdoors and also uh, wind, air motion influences these. I mean, how, does, how does it make this, what's this from? This is from contraction, by the way. This, these I think are made from contraction and expansion of the material of the, of the carbon paper in relationship to the gesso. Now I have again, and then again, uh, uh, Brandon, you, you, uh, you mentioned these straight lines. This is all of this randomness, and then it's what these sharp, perfect, straight lines that are varying. So all the black modules for me represent vibrations, waveforms, which could be sound. So all of these are sound modules, sound vibrations, and they vary. They're like the tonality of instrumentation, all sort of within a range, but infinitely variable throughout the system, right? And these have density just like a chord, like an orchestration of a chord, like a, like a quarter harmony or a diminished chord or upper structure triads that are used in harmonics. Yeah. Hey, John, can I interrupt you? Yeah, yeah. Um, we just got a question from our friend, Jerry Iverson. Um, yeah. He asked if, he, he, he's asking you if randomness is real or are you causing? Is random real? Is or randomness you... real or are you causing it? Both. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of a question is that, Iverson? <laughs> can you elaborate on that okay random random is plant you know planned randomness they're different as you can see i've been talking about different layers of randomness R randomness can occur within a certain range like that's infinitely variable frequency modulated piece over here all of the the the, the, the modulation of the of, of these dot structures is infinitely variable right but it's still within a certain range so it's like so now we're getting into stochastic systems how random is random? How totally chaotic is chaos? But it, it has to have, uh, uh, let's see, who, 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 who made the state? Uh, uh, there, there's an there's a artist that can't kind of think of the name. Uh, said that without, without the grid, there is no chaos because everything, nothing can be defined. That's our, our, our Ellsworth Kelly, by the way, said that. So, so that's uh, randomness can be created. Randomness cannot happen. Randomness can be like what happened in the universe. What is the universe? What created? Where did it come from? That's random to a certain degree. We get into uh, uh, theoretical physics. But this is some simple, simple concept of randomness that I've generated in my studio, which somehow feels like I'm tapping in, believe it or not. They, they feel pure, they've made themselves. I haven't interacted, but only to the level of, of creating the grid. But they seem to me, I would say that they're random. I mean, this, this, this is a random cap. The form is endlessly, miraculously random. I've interfered here and intervened with some, with some impressions to another uh, range of randomness, with some other grid, grid uh, structures that are perfectly uh, interfaced with that, just to, to reference the grid again. But it's what's happening, these, these, modu these modules, so this is a certain degree of random. Okay, let's see, random. I created this randomness, but it's still within a range, so it's not really totally random. But here's what's happening, and Jerry, that is a good question, and I, I, I can't, uh, you know, we have to think further, deeper. But so, so we have the vertical structures that I seem to sound, and then, and then the, the, these, these fractures, these fractures, are generated by the variation in the sequence of these Fibonacci, Fibonacci series generated rectangles. These rectangles in inches are one inch, two inch, three inch, five inch, and eight inch. You can see, here's two, here's three, here's five, here's an eight. There are different combination of those. So within the, the grid, this module of this grid, the variables of the distribution and relationship of the Fibonacci numbers within the system also defined, because this is constant, it defines the size of these other fissures or fractures. The fracture, see, these, these are within this surface here, these, the, the size of these has influenced the size of these 
which are, these are constant, but these become infinitely variable based on the other okay. elements they're generated from. Do you want to walk us over to the column? Yeah. One the lawyer book that you deconstructed and this reconstructed? Is, yeah, okay, here. Here, yeah, overview of this whole piece now. I, I see it as vertical, vertical structures. The other fissures are, seem horizontal. They're horizontal, they're steps, they're up and down. They reference the melody. Okay, there's a melody, there's a harmony in this. And then there's a third variation of pulse in this grid that's created by the physicality of the mat, of the material. And these the pulse is really constant, like it would be in certain music. Pulse with all this going through it is here in the three dimension, third dimension of this, there is a reference to pulse to time. Okay. I do, love the, I do love the panels when we installed it and, and that space in between that adds that dimensionality that you can't see on screen right now because it looks like they're just lines in the work, yeah, but right in real life, it. it's yeah. just part of the piece. I was just thinking when you were talking about the randomness, I get lost sometimes in your, in your, I don't know, I'm not in your mind, but your mind loses me. I thought of the column, you know, and how they how it relates and the randomness of, yeah. of the column and, and yeah, how that's we... a correct random system. I mean that is again, but it's so Absolutely. logical, it's so it's so tight. It's it's also in additionally totally random, and which I call, you know, planned random or tight loose. I like that concept tight loose. And it's so tight, but yet so loose, both. I mean, look at look at what's going on with this, this thing. It's just like First of all, the, sheet, the sheets are exactly trimmed to the thousandth of an inch, to six and a quarter by six and a quarter inch. That's a machine that made that. The machine made this whole piece based on me setting up the system and to create the randomness. Okay, so this is, what you see here is the edge of printed sheets, just like you see this edge here on this piece. This is the edge where the ink comes over to the edge and forms that, that form that you see. These are the edges of an actual publication. Am I answering your, am I getting to your question, John? Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, these are the out of sync, trimmed press sheets of the Montana Lawyer magazine. It's printed in black and white, you know, what else? And it's the, it's the, ha it's the half tones, the, the photography, that slice through, so you see grayscale variation in these filaments. These stacks are, are again stacked in a Fibonacci sequence, but this is fracturing down through the type, just randomly through stacks that are pre-planned in their think thickness of the same piece. So are we tracking the same printed sheet? Yeah. Are put together so we have a strata that has a defined thickness. Otherwise, if you didn't do that, if you just started trimming some printed magazines, each sheet would be different, and you would end up with something more like this. But this, that's the, that's the plan. That's what reveals the unbelievable, undulating, endless randomness of the type, especially the typography. All of these words, all of this language, these are like vibrations of tracking through the language, the written language form. And here we have the language, and then we hit something where it's merged with another graphic, and there's blank. I like this piece so much, John, because I think it it goes, it relates back to your long career in in the print shop and all of that. And but it's so it so well relates to it ties into the work that you're creating or that you're allowing to be created, you know, through your hand, but this one, I also love how organic it is versus the, the all the all the wall wall pieces that are yes they're random, but there is still always they're always very much contained within their square. And when we installed this, once again, we didn't know exactly what it would be like, and then it just it just went, and it was it was a little scary for a moment, and then it stopped, and then yeah. we just thought, "Wow, that is beautiful! Look at that!" Yeah. Can you pull back, Tim, and Tim, and see the whole piece? One of the things that uh, John said a few minutes ago was about nature, and he said it so quickly. You know, he he mentioned like when he was in front of uh, Stratofracture, it it's like a natural process. It's the wind, and it's the 
And I think it's that really struck me when we were talking about the show is that he's almost creating these natural processes. He's, he's taking himself out of the equation and setting up, setting up the system that creates the artwork yep. and, yep. and it's mimicking these natural processes like yep. surface tension and gravity, you know, the gravity of this, this column and the, and the shear that's involved. It's really interesting to think about this abstract work in terms of natural processes and in, in making nature. Yeah. And, and again, yeah. it's, nature, it's totally made by a machine. The only hand I have had in it is counting sheets. And that's what I love about it also. But alluding to your perception about the, being naturally created, the stratifracture, here's my stratifracture, here's my, here's my, and, and you distilled that wonderfully, but here, here here's my an analogy to that also that's exciting for me that sort of like gives me this energy is that when, when, when it's all said and done, these, 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 these aren't pictures of nature. They're not representations of nature. They are nature. What you see is nature. And that's what I find exciting and it feels right. It feels pure. It feels real. Um, Arden, I, I feel bad that we haven't heard from you. I think you know John the best out of anybody and you've got such amazing insights into his work. Um, the the catalog isn't going to be ready until probably early July, but your your essay and treatment of John's work is just masterful. It's such a such a great uh, addition to the to Montana art history, really. Oh, thank you, Brandon. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's different to uh, contemplate uh, John's work over a period of weeks and sit at a keyboard staring at a screen and trying to come up with a, a lucid ana analysis and draw, find analogies for what he does with his materials and his ideas, his, his uh, the concepts that drive him, uh, the process of uh, just responsiveness. He is so alive to everyday experience, uh, plugged into social media, cable news, uh, his, vis his acuity in the visual sphere and the tactile haptic area really comes out of the print shop. He was so excited. Uh, I remember this back in the 90s. He, he, he was taking stuff out of the trash from the print shop. The, you know, the, uh, just the random trimmings and spoiled sheets and uh, his first drawings were on, on the aluminum print, printing plates with uh, cattle markers. So uh, he, uh, he's just very alive and uh, he's as vibrant today as he was when I met him, but, uh, to, which to me is uh, a testimony to the power of art as a, as a uh, rejuvenating and sustaining force in life. And uh, John, John inspires me deeply. He's kind of like a raw nerve. When like how you describe <laughs> him, you know, he takes in information. It's all input and output, and I think, um, you know, the special the special uh, gift that we have is hearing hearing his ideas synthesized through his experience and, and directly from directly from him. There's nobody yeah. like. Him. No, I'm. We're lucky to have him. I tell you, he's <laughs> brightened brightened our lives and Billings, and uh, I think I. I I think he's almost a one-man avant-garde, but uh, he's also a, 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 a true collaborator and a person who puts his arms around a lot of people and and uh, and, and feeds off uh, younger artists. I mean, he's he's really uh, tight with Shane De Leon, a, a punk musician. Uh, with his band is called Miss Massive Snowflake, and uh, he and John have collaborated and improvised. Improvised performances, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's just exciting to see this generational uh, uh, procession of uh, people uh, of different ages and different sensibilities uh, interacting in uh, John's orbit. Yeah, I don't see I don't see Shane on as an attendee, but I see Mary. Mary is with us. 
and I, I I'm assuming that Shane's with with Mary watching the feed right now. And I, I love the sense of collaboration that's happened at Kirk's Grocery and how John's been able to plug in. And you as your, yourself, as a, as a visual artist, um, being able to, to take advantage of that resource. Uh, I did want to open it up. We've got, we've got just a number of fine minds who, who joined us from all over the globe here tonight. And if there's any questions um, that anybody has for John or for Gordon for that matter, um, Oh, Mary writes, they're at Kirk's watching right now. So that's not too surprising. <laughs> and Gordon, your show's coming up at Kirk's um, just in a month, right? Yeah, first week of June. First week of June. Can't Crank wait. Thank you for work. <laughs> that's great. Are there any other questions from, from the audience uh, about John or John's work? John, you've taken us just on an amazing journey tonight. Well, thank you. You've, uh, it's been precipitated by you also, you artists, genuine artists. It's a, uh, it, it's an inspiration. Feedback loop. <laughs> thank you so much. Like, Thanks, John. All the interactions and it, 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 it you know, it, 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 ideas inspire more ideas and the collaboration process is a huge part of it. Have you been able to work in your in your studio while this exhibition's been up, or has this been so all consuming with the uh, the artist book and the the catalog and everything that you haven't been able to? You've had yeah, to focus on that, right? Yeah, I've got I've got uh, you know I've got the the, the frameworks, the ideas percolating and not, notated at two thirty in the morning in my uh, <laughs> in my notes, <laughs> but uh, I've mostly been working on the on the catalog. Uh, which I'm designing, and it's been a totally, I mean, I've been working on catalogs and design for 40 years, but this has taken on a whole new dimension, and it's just exciting, and it's taken me places that I've never been before, uh, you know, just based on, again, the opportunity presented to me by the Missoula Art Museum. The, the whole staff, you know, the, the museum is just so wonderful and inspiring, and it, it's actually initiated all, all, a lot of this this thinking, and so I appreciate that. And also everybody on the panel, you know, uh, your great questions. Tim here has been a, a collaborator uh, on camera, uh, illustrating variables, right, of, of audio and visual. And Michael over here, if you don't see, we had some great chats beforehand. He was curious about things that I was telling you about my uh, somebody. Now uh, Tim, this is this is interesting. You know, Tim uh, calls calls Michael up. He's an associate. He called, he called Michael up yesterday afternoon and said, hey, we've got a gig. We're going over to the Missoula Art Museum. And you're going to be on the, on staff to uh, to, to uh, do the production. And he goes, what? Wait, wait a minute. What are we doing? That's it. See you later. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and so he comes. You know, it was just fascinating. That's just some little element. Well, I related the story. That, that brought to mind Miles Davis, my, you know, where I gained a lot of my ideas from. Miles would, would do the Miles. On a, on a September uh, evening, would call Wayne, call up Wayne Shore, would call up Rudy Han Hancock and, and Tony Williams, say, "Hey, you guys, get down to the studio tomorrow at ten o'clock for a recording." And this was like it was like happened just out of nowhere. And they'd lay down this unbelievable music, spon spontaneous. Uh, Miles smiled is one of the greatest. Job. All that music went down just just from that that in the moment. The planned random, it's all there. You don't, you know, you let it happen. A lot of this has that, that feeling of jazz. When you hit that moment, you hit that second when it all, bam, just happens. You don't I know what, that, but then it happens. I love that you're treating the catalog as almost another artwork. And I would it say- is. It's, Definitely, uh, an art it, book, a mass produced art book. It's as, as playful and as inventive as the that you guys art that have come that I've never seen before in, typo in typographic design uh, based on fracturing. Again, I haven't, you know, I told Kim to have me, if I go for more than 25 seconds without using the word fracture, you're supposed to tell me, you know, fracture. <laughs> fracture. <laughs> so many possibilities. <laughs> Concept. And it's part of the accident. It's part of letting chance, giving chance a chance. John Cage runs through every breath 
of everyone, whether they know it or not. <laughs> you know, give chance, chance, all of this swirling around, all this energy. I'm just overwhelmed sometimes. I get so excited, you know, I, I, I can't, I break down. You know? So I, I just appreciate the whole production. I, again, I love the production. These guys, I see it every time, these guys doing the streams. They're, they're, they're doing the streams out to the world and they're still uh, experimenting with the interfaces and getting the sound or getting the, you know, just casually sort of, you know, two or you know, 40 seconds before the production. And then it all comes together. You know, we have, yeah. So it's a miraculous experience, collaboration, and it's generated, it's precipitated by the collaborative spirit of everybody around us. I, th I think you inspire that collaboration in everyone. Thanks so much. The, uh, the exhibition's up through July 14th or 17th? 17th. And so I hope you're able to stop down at the Missoula Art Museum and see the exhibition. We've got a couple more, a couple more months of this exhibition and we've had such a great response from, from audiences. And how about anybody else? Any words in closing? Gordon or John or John? Calsbeek? Lodge? <laughs> No, oh, it's been a pleasure and an honor, John. There's a lot of love coming in on the chats, and it's been it's been it's been quite a few years coming. I remember talking about this with you years ago. You know, when you would you'd come by and and spill all your energy on us and tell us all the stuff you were going to do, and, and I'm glad it finally happened. Yeah, thank you. That's again just for for mounting this show and establishing and producing and making it happen because it's a major show in your major museum. So. I just kept, I'm just overwhelmed. I, I'm just so thankful. Great work. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. We've had uh, such an outpouring of love from everybody. We're going to go ahead and, and end now. And uh, thanks for joining us. This has been produced live on YouTube and in a, a live Zoom webinar, so you'll be able to access it at the Missoula Art Museum um, website a little bit later on, or you can search under John Lodge on YouTube. Good night, everybody. Good night.